brings us to the next panel discussion, which is on developing a responsible destination. Uh, we've been hearing the words responsible, sustainable a lot in the last couple of years. Even Peter said he's nauseous about it. And we are a bit confused on what really it means and what aspects of our industry, our lives, tourism, uh, and everything that we do uh, should be sustainable and should be responsible. But you know, not every country, not every region, not every uh, city or tourist destination has the means and wherewithal to become uh, a sustainable or to invest in sustainability um, in a broader manner. But there have been certain examples in certain regions that have done it in a very innovative fashion, in an innovative format, bringing in newer initiatives that can get the funding, that can get the money, and that can also involve the local communities um, to bring in a more sustainable efforts um, in promoting tourism. And that's what uh, we'll be discussing in the panel discussion uh, right now. I am moderating the session and with me um, is a really great set of speakers. I've been speaking with them since yesterday uh, on and off. So let me invite them on stage. Stephen Shipani, Principal Tourism Industry Specialist, Asian Development Bank. He's the man with the money. All the ways to get it. Damia Serrano Miracle, Dr. Miracle is what he asked me to call him. Uh, Experience Marketing and Research Director at Catalan Tourist Board. Mr. Dhananjay Regni, CEO of Nepal Tourism Board. He also won an award yesterday. Sharzat Datu Hazi Saleh Askor, Chief Executive Officer, Sarawak Tourism Board. Welcome. And Sioni Moala Mafi, Chief Executive Officer, Ministry of Tourism, Tonga. Now you can see the mix of panelists, mix of destinations that we have on this stage today. Uh, these are regions, these are destinations that are small, that have their own niche, um, uh, you know, capabilities, interests, uh, ideas but may not have the wherewithal of, of a Europe or a US or a Singapore, uh, so to say, but they are still developing a sustainable tourism um, destinations in their own regions. And, and that's what we'll try to uh, get from uh, uh, you know, the conversation today. Uh, let me start with Sione. Um, if I can come to you first, because possibly with 100,000 population uh, in Tonga, you're one of the smallest destinations, at least on this stage right now. Uh, when we talk of sustainability, when we talk of developing a responsible destination, what does your, uh, you know, what do you think about it from the perspective of the place that you come from? Well, thank you, Agana. Thank you, Agana. Um, all protocol observed. On the outset, I would like to say thank you to the Ipada for the opportunity to be here. I bring with me greetings from the government and people of the Kingdom of Tonga. Small economy, smallest kingdom in the world. We are in the middle of South Pacific. Uh, looking at tourism and the issues today that we've discussed, uh, I think it's full time to talk about the benefits of tourism. The foreign exchange earning, create employments, development of infrastructures. But I think it is time that we look at how we, can, we maximize the benefit from tourism. And maximizing the benefit of tourism, we're looking at benefit and cost. Benefit to who, cost to who. I think there are a few issues that we raised. Cost to the people and the well-being of the country. The cost in terms and benefit in terms of economy, economic benefits, the cost may be and benefit in terms of the culture, the people, and the cost and benefit analysis of the environment and its impact of tourism in the environment. I think that is, and that is very, very important. So the challenge is, the challenge is how can we balance that? Yeah. And it is to us from a small, very country, we are looking at the quality and quantity versus quality. We are not looking at mass 
tourism and its impact on the environment. We are looking at economic ecotourism. One of the examples is one, Tonga is one of the three countries that I'm aware of that make whale watching an industry and swim with the whales. We are looking at ecotourism. We are looking at preserving our coral sea. And we're looking at the issues Tonga and other Pacific Islands, with due respect to Nauru and others who are here, is very, very small, but our ocean is much, much bigger. And we are not looking at the land, but we are looking at the continent, which we call a blue continent. We are looking at the water. We are looking at the marine resources that we have and utilize it. And I think those are issues that we are looking at. And it's not something that we have continually planned but we continually review our policies, continually work in partnership, both private and public sector. Thank you. Right. You know, you spoke about um, mass tourism and how you're not focusing on mass tourism, but developing the region uh, from an eco, uh, uh, for, uh, from an environment perspective. Shahzad, if I can come to you, you know, uh, you represent a region that's maybe not as small as Tonga, but it still has a low population density. But the issues that face even bigger destinations, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's issues like the pandemic, um, or, or, or the other threats, uh, the existential threats that we've spoken about, that affects smaller destinations as well. What is the challenges, what are the challenges that you're facing in the recovery part, uh, you know, considering you're small, considering resources may not be as much, but the challenges still pers persist, right? Thank you very much, Jenna. So basically, on, on, for me, I would like to just share a little bit. Probably most of you do not know where Sarawak is, so let me put on perspective where Sarawak is. Yeah, so Sarawak is one of the states in Malaysia, and uh, we are one of the largest states in Malaysia out of the 14 states, uh, with only 2.8 million population. Yeah? Um, so before pandemic, we are very fortunate unknowingly, you know, our number of visitors is about 52% are domestic market okay. and 48% are international market. So when we have this uh, pandemic, uh, you know, we have been, uh, I think, naturally wanting to bring international to come to uh, the state, yeah, as our tourism and focusing very much of the foreign uh, tourists. So with the pandemic, of course, domestic market become the core. And, you know, uh, we were not so disrupted because the major market was uh, domestic market. Hence, our strategy had to be refocused. And uh, ever since the pandemic, we focused on domestic market. Uh, obviously, the challenge is that a lot of our players are outbound, you know? Uh, so they have to change and be an inbound traveler and look into appreciating what Sarawak has to offer to the local market. And, and, and therefore, uh, from Sarawak Tourism Board and from the ministry in itself, we worked towards as soon as possible when there was a lockdown in March 18, we had to re-strategize and therefore focus on domestic, really focus on domestic and look into incentives that will encourage the players to focus on our. And at the end of the day, we actually, what we did was to get the players and our uh, local domestic market to appreciate mm. our very own destination. Mm. And you know, and, and uh, it has helped us. I wouldn't want to call a, a subsidy given, but more of an incentive given to the players to change their mindset, to make and let them realize how important domestic market is uh, to survive in the longer term and to make it sustainable. It's a bonus for us when we have multiple countries coming and visitors to Sarawak. But we must and must appreciate our domestic market because they are the ones that will be our repeat customers. They are the ones that will come for short uh, vacation and all and they will be able to sustain us in a tourism dollar and everything. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because, you know, we've seen that also happen in India when international travel was, was blocked because of uh, COVID. When it started opening up, it was the local domestic tourism that kind of helped sustain. And I think that's why India has leaped uh, forward in recovery part. But another point that you made on, uh, you know, domestic tourism, uh, the change in mindset. So it's both a challenge as well as an opportunity in itself if people can change the mindset to promote more domestic tourism, you have a local audience right there uh, who also understand the nitty gritties of the region. They understand the culture, the language. Uh, well, uh, thanks for that point. Uh, Dhananjay, if I can come to you, you know, you, your challenges are very different from many others, uh, you know, especially from the climate change perspective. Your region is one that has suffered a lot and that invariably impacts the biggest uh, you know, source of um, income for the country, which is tourism, and also developing it more sustainably is at the heart of what you are doing right now. Um, how are you adapting to the threats of climate change from a sustainable tourist destination perspective? Uh, thanks, Arjuna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you raise a very completely a different question, and uh, I think this is uh, something that people are not uh, given attention to. So actually, uh, let me start with the data. If you look at the global temperature rise, then uh, Nepal uh, is having an uh, annual temperature rise of 0 0.056 degrees centigrade. And if you look at the higher altitude, it is 0 0.82, 0 0.082 percent per annum, which is higher. Higher temperature, and in the lowland, we have a less. It is around 0 0.021 degree centigrade. So this shows that uh, our high mountains are at the risk of the climate change, especially the global warming. And that's why these glaciers are retreating very fast, a number of new glacier lakes are forming. And these glacier lakes are, uh, can be brushed out anytime. And because of the climate change, again, the hoodoo type of uh, cyclones, they are attacking, they are frequently happening. Sometimes these cloud bursts are happening even during the peak season, this year the monsoon goes a little late, up to the late, and even in the season during the October, we have a number of landslides in the mountain area where, we, where people were there for the trekking. So I think all these climate change is somehow impacting much more and giving a very negative message to the global community, and that is not in our hand. When we talk about the sustainability, when we talk about the responsible tourism, when we talk about how we can manage, that is in our hand. We can make the tourists to you know, uh, act responsibly and uh, damage less, uh, or uh, they, can fr uh, they can act friendly with the environment. But this is climate change, this is not in our hand. And uh, the, uh, being a location, uh, our, uh, because the, always the monsoon and the, these are the new, mo new uh, mountains and they are fragile all the time. And because of this climate change, all these extreme events are happening. And, uh, more importantly, the number of the avalanches are increasing. And the permafrost, which is a kind of a frozen ice, even in the rock walls, they, they are frozen and they are intact. The number of the rock slides uh, started to increase. And this all started to create a lot of new problems uh, that we cannot control. So what happened now, the Nepal government started to think about it really seriously, and uh, we started to lower down some of the glacier lakes. So we have already lowered down two glacier lakes. That means if one glacier lake brushed out, like in a, in, in a month of uh, October sometime, if one glacier lake brushed out, in, at a time, we may lose, uh, lost uh, uh, thousands of people. So just to minimize that risk, government said that, okay, in the major trekking trails, if there are some uh, dangerous glacier lakes, we need to uh, reduce them down, or we, we, need, we need to make uh, some protection, or we need, uh, need to reduce the lake level so that uh, uh, we can keep them intact as in their position. But how many lakes you can control? Every year there are the thousands of new lakes are coming up and they are joining. You know, it started as a small pond uh, in between the glacier and it started to join with one another. And within a few years, it becomes uh, like a kilometers of big and like a 60, 70 or sometimes a 100 meter plus deep lake. And what happened? That much water brushed out at a time. So this is a big challenge that we are facing. At the same time, the rock collectivities are increasing. And in the mountain tourism, people are going for the climbing. Before, normally we thought that the avalanches, we could uh, see the uh, hanging ice and we can say that, okay, it will not happen at people. But now nobody can predict. It, it can happen. And so this type of the natural disaster are increasing. And 
obviously the uh, major reason behind it is the climate change or especially the temperature rising. Uh, yeah. so this I, you have a, a other problem that you were talking to me which is under control and that is garbage in in you know yeah in these so places. another problem that we are facing obviously garbage is something that we can control but uh, for that we need to uh, uh, educate the even the climbers or the trackers who are visiting in the mountainous area so uh, till last year we we uh, we have make a task force including the nepal army and uh, uh, tourism entrepreneurs especially the people who are involved in the climbing uh, so every year we started to clean and uh, uh, millions of ton of the garbage we have bring it back to kathmandu and we have disposed that but now we decided how long people keep going and they are making a trace and how many year we are keep going to clean it it is not a sustainable way so we decided that uh, uh, so we uh, so far uh, every trackers or the every climber who go to the mountains they have to pay some deposit and once they come back they said that oh, i have bring bought my all the garbage is back then they we used to refund that amount so we purpose government we will not refund any amount anymore because they don't bring everything, everything. what they have taken back up there so we will charge them as an environmental cost and we will bring um, we will manage the garbage this is the one another we are thinking about giving some incentives to the people who will bring back their garbages and another we are raising the awareness in the companies who are uh, uh, who are doing a tour of uh, tour operator or the climbing or the trekking companies that uh, whatever the garbage is you are bringing up please bring it back because when you are going up you have a lot number of people who are going carrying your baggages taking uh, people right. up there, they can bring back when they are coming back because the, all the food items were already finished. Right. So they they, are, they can bring some of the garbages back by themselves. So this is also I think this is the issue that we are uh, you know handling so far. And uh, last year we cleaned all the mountains. There are some dead bodies that were there, and nobody is interested on that. Especially the their families, the person who died there, they said that he used to love the mountain and he is. Uh, resting there in the peace. So that is also not the solution, sure. but we need to find a solution that whatever is happened, they need to bring back. That is, mountains is not a, it is, it is okay, people, even for the mountain lovers, we cannot leave them there. Whoever is the, there, we have to the bring back. The point them. is that even visitors and tourists need to be made accountable um, in, 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 in tourism. Yeah. And let me bring in Damia here, because he can bring in a perspective of a more established destination uh, Nami, you've been there, done that. Um, you know, you, you are a destination uh, that sees hundreds of thousands of vis visitors every year. Uh, you have had your set of challenges and you've found initiatives to deal with it. Over tourism, uh, mass tourism that Sione spoke about and, and the impacts of over tourism we, we are seeing in many regions, uh, how has Catalonia uh, worked on that part? Um, I have to confess you that uh, I was very worried about this roundtable because when I was on the plane flying to see this place, I was thinking what I'm going to do in, in a roundtable representing uh, 19 million tourist arrivals <laughs> and 15 million domestic arrivals coming from the other side of the world, sharing a place with Malaysia, Ponga, with Nepal. And from yesterday, I started to understand that there are more things in common than actually what I was in my mind before because we are... Uh, regardless that this the geographical distance that we have mm -hmm. we're sharing and we're facing actually the same type of problems probably we are in another stage but actually they're the same so we've been learning some lessons that maybe we could be shared with with you from from our perspective um, the first one is um, we started to focus well the problem of our, our tourism and mass tourism when we did realize that the problem was not uh, the tourism itself, the tourism sector in our society. The problem became uh, the territorial problem. When we were working the DMO that we represent, uh, dealing with a problem from just the tourism sector without the rest of the sectors of our destination, we didn't improve. When we started to do realize that, that we become from a city, Barcelona, basically, with tourism to become a touristic city. Then we did start to realize that problems have to be fixed up from environmental department, from uh, urbanism department, from uh, security department, not only from tourism sector. That was this change of our mindset that started to flow better the decisions. And 
the first ambition when we created a governance uh, tool to deal with this in the beginning was let's let's focus on how to change the regulations how to change uh, the uh, the the, uh, the policies but then we did realize that that was not the way and i was very happy to listen to the president of uh, pata this morning because actually once you are working or you are on the field working you are organized um, this governance tool you do realize that the bottom up is much more powerful and then in 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 that in that round table was the specific uh, little projects that come up. We started to discuss. We did realize that was working well in a specific neighborhood of the city that we would apply and reply to other parts of the city. And that is what giving us enough uh, power to start to change the regulations, to start to uh, fix uh, new policies in the tourist mobility of the city, change in terms of uh, tourism collect taxes in the accommodation places. All this has been basically from the bottom-up perspective more than um, top-down perspective. So the f first lesson, it's, it's basically that. And I have some other examples that later if you want we can share, sure. but more specific uh, little best practices. Yeah, you know, um, developing a responsible destination or bringing in more sustainable uh, efforts requires money, whether it is to build infrastructure, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, to, to develop hotels, uh, uh, waste management is what Stephen was earlier telling me. Um, you, you, need, you need funds, right? How do you get those, th that sustainable financing? And Stephen, you possibly, since you, you work in this area, you've worked with smaller destinations. Firstly, tell me what is the challenge in getting the finance for smaller destinations when they want to turn sustainable or are you know, making that effort? There is garbage in, in most of the tourist destinations. That needs cleaning and that requires money and manpower. Where do we get that? Okay, th thank you. Um, yeah, where's, where's the money come? Who's gonna pay for all this, right? Uh, before, I have a few ideas I, I wanna share, but let's just start by once again thanking Ras Al Khaimah, Tourism Development Authority. Fantastic hosting, fantastic meal last night. Um, Rocky, I guess the only regret that I have was I took many photos and we made many new friends. Um, I'll share the photos with my friends and family offline. If I post those on social media, my boss isn't going to let me travel again and come to any conferences. So, <laughs> it, was just, it was just fantastic. Thank, thank you so much for the hosting last night. Amazing. And thank you, Pata, for organizing the panel here. And I hope we all were sustainable. <laughs> But no, no, j j just a wonderful experience. My first time here in the Emirates, so it's really been a, a wonderful experience. So let's see, how are we gonna pay for all this? How are we gonna pay for the sustainability? I think the answer to the challenges is gonna be in maybe some of my responses, right? So let's start by recalling some of the conversations that we've had in our keynote this morning, in the panel yesterday on sustainability. Everybody tells us that tourists are willing to pay. Tourists are willing to pay for sustainability. Tourists are willing to pay for clean destinations. Tourists are willing to pay to you know, clean up the externalities that come with tourism development. Why don't we test that hypothesis, right? You know, so we've heard tourists are willing to pay. Let's test that hypothesis with fair, transparent, and intelligently designed tax policies, right? And, and we have some excellent examples from some people, some countries that are attending here. I can say, for example, yes, it, it costs money. It costs, a tourist comes to visit our destination, we're making an investment in public infrastructure and in paying for the border guards and paying for the additional roads and water supplies and others. Never mind the marketing and all the private investment on hotels, but there, there's a public investment that comes with that. So I think we've heard the tourists are willing to pay. Let's make it automatic that somewhere along the destination payment chain that there's a fair, transparent, you know, efficient mechanism to, to help pay for some of these public investments that are needed to keep, continue to keep our destinations livable for the residents and for the visitors. One such example is the Philippines travel tax, which is a pretty simple mechanism where, you know, for outbound travelers, there's a fee, 1,600 to 2,700 pesos, that's added on to the airline ticket. I think that's about 20, 30, 40 dollars, depending on the class of travel. 
And, and where does that money go? Okay, well, half of that money goes to the Tourism Infrastructure Enterprise uh, Administration Zone, TIEZA, mm -hmm. and so which is used to reinvest in destination infrastructure. All those sexy things that we you know, associate with tourism development, landfills, wastewater treatment, <laughs> you know, access roads, public drainage, and others. Then we've heard about the need to reinvest in people, right? You know, reinvest in the people in our destinations. 40% of that fee goes to pay, goes to the National Commission on, on Education. So basically it's paying for education, technical, vocational, other types of educational initiatives. Then we've heard about the need to protect our natural and our cultural resources. 10% of that goes to the National Commission for the Advancement of the Arts. I, apologies to colleagues from the Philippines. I can't catch all the acronyms, but basically it's being paid to protect and maintain cultural and natural heritage. And, and these fees are for tourists and for outbound travelers, and they're quite large. So also what was used for that, you know, there'll be another crisis. We know that, right? There, there was the COVID crisis, and countries that were in a good fiscal position were able to you know, help tourism enterprises get through that through various measures. The tourism enterprise, the TIEZA of the Philippines, actually had a very, very large balance and were able to transfer some of that back to the central government to use to pay for some of these COVID response initiatives that they had. So, you know, save, not, not only pay for the future needs, but save some for the next crisis. And, and, and once again, through these fair, transparent, efficient, tax administrations and fees. I think this is one way to pay for it. Secondly, I'm gonna, I said I wouldn't talk for seven minutes, but I'm gonna talk for five, because I have five ideas that I'd like to share. Then we'll take comments from the other. Yeah, the second is that, and we heard from our colleague from Catalonia, Damia, online travel agents and online short-term rental platforms have tremendous market power, right? You know, we know that. And, there's a tremendous amount of throughput in terms of bookings and rooms and payments and others. It can be an ultra efficient way mm -hmm. of collecting taxes and fees and remitting those back to wherever the local reg regulations tell that operator to do that. So I would say for destination managers, yeah, work with the online travel agents, work with the online short term rental agencies to be able to efficiently and effectively raise these public resources and have those remitted to the authorities that manage this. There's other policy measures like van val land value capture, where we create a virtuous cycle, right? So there's a public investment in a road or something, and land prices go way up, and we can have, attract some taxes and fees and others to pay for other public goods investments, things like parks and other types of infrastructure that's needed. Um, quickly on public-private partnerships, public-private partnerships can be huge like a build, operate, transfer for an airport or something, and these are, can be very complex deals that are way beyond the, the, the means of a community, a community-led tourism that we've heard. But there are also excellent opportunities to bring together tour operators, the community to develop tourism services under these public-private community partnerships that I think there's a strong role for development partners like ADB, associations like Pata to play in using their convening power to be that kind of fair and neutral advisor to both parties, you know, so they're raising resources to protect and conserve the, the, the natural or cultural heritage that they have, but, but also to have a good viable product, you know, that, that can be sold. Um, and finally, there's us, there's development partners, like the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and others, where we can use our very strong credit rating to borrow from the international markets and, and, and pass on that financing to, to our developing members often in collaboration and co-financing with development partners outside the region. One of those is actually the OPEC Fund for International Development, right. of which the UAE is a, is a member. So thank you. Right. There were a couple of ideas and thoughts and you know, ways in which um, uh, destinations are finding the funding uh, sustainably. Uh, Sion, any of this uh, has worked for your uh, region? Thank you. I would like to bring it back into my perspective. Small mm -hmm. island country, 100,000 people, with a land area of uh, less than three, 300 square miles, and a per capita of 4,000. We have been staying in these islands for 3,000 years. Cyclone season every year, which is five months a year. Mm. I'm talking about sustainability here in mm. resilience. After 3,000 years, we still stay there. So we are resilient, we are sustainable, the way we live in our culture and our environment. Mm. i tell you one more thing. 
this British explorer, Captain James Cook, explored a lot of countries in the Pacific, Asia, South America, and America. The only country that he named the Friendly Islands was Tonga. Why? Because we will live happily, sustainably, and resilient to the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our culture, it is our environment that we want to share with the rest of the, the world. It is our culture, our environment that we want to share with the tourists. Thank you very much. Well, you know, that's the learning that uh, Tonga can bring to all the other tourist destinations as well, even bigger ones, is how you can be small but yet responsible because you live with the nature and environment around you. You don't see it as a product but as part of your life, right? And, and that, that's what uh, Sioni... Uh, Sarawak, uh, you know, have there been the taxation system for visitors or tourists or, or even industry uh, worked to bring in sustainable financing for some of the programs that you've uh, mentioned? For, for the state of Sarawak, what, what we have done is that um, we are very fortunate that the state government in itself yeah, looks at tourism as a eco, uh, as a driver, a key driver. And, um, you know, the pandemic in itself has actually accelerated a lot of things for us, yeah? And for, for the state of Sarawak, what we did is that we focused on PPP, uh, the public-private partnership, and uh, we go into sustainability with that mindset. And uh, it has been very fortunate for us, basically, because uh, it is very welcome, especially to the rural uh, areas, you know, the urban are uh, good for its own, but for the rural areas, we like to engage with them much more and provide them to get them the understanding of what it is. Uh, because it is for everyone, it is, uh, tourism is for everyone. The urban are well taken care of, suburban, but the rural is what we want to develop and yet leave that authenticity. So we provide the fund, we develop that area for them so that they are able to earn and gain economic uh, you know, a benefit out of that. So I, I think from, from the state of Sarawak, uh, the PPP uh, concept is really working very well. And going niche works for you, right? Yes, this is definitely we're into niche market. Uh, we are not into mass market. I think we believe that 80% of our land mass is uh, forest. We would like to preserve that and conserve that. Uh, and we focus on biodiversity, conserving biodiversity, our heritage, and of course, our cultural element. And through the Rainforest World Music Festival, that's one of the ways that we sustain our uh, elements of our cultural and heritage. And I think uh, this is one of the ways, uh, through events such as the Rainforest, because we truly believe that is our assets. The, uh, the Rainforest of over 140 million, Right. is definitely an asset and why should we uh, change that and look into modern area when we should be focusing that and building Absolutely. it bigger and better. Right. Dananjay, you know, you also have a travel tax, right, for visitors. We've seen even Bhutan increase the uh, visitor payment from $50 to $200 and, and they've said that people will have to pay uh, if they want to, uh, to visit a sustainable and a more responsible destination. Uh, how do you bring the balance? You know, you also want to call tourists, right? You, you don't want to dissuade them by higher payments and higher taxes. I know people want to pay, but there is a limit to how much even tourists can pay. How do you bring that balance? Well, actually, uh, like uh, Bhutan, we are, we are just collecting a $10 in the, at the airport as an uh, in a, a ticket as a NQ uh, tax. And that is especially for the promotion of Nepal uh, in the, uh, throughout the world. And uh, second part, whoever are going for the trekkings, we are charging again them. Uh, if some individual are going $10, sorry, $20, and if somebody is going in a group $10, that is especially for uh, the rescue if something happened in the mountains. And that money especially goes for the maintenance of the mountain trails, uh, uh, building the wooden bridges, and so on. So, Whatever we are collecting, we are especially, you know, we are, we are investing on that. And uh, this garbage problem also that we used to spend some money, but now the government has started to allocate a different one. That is another part. 
And uh, so we are collecting, but we are, it is not that high that, uh, you know, um, these tourists cannot pay. And most of the money is going for the betterment of them and, uh, uh, and provide the better services. And educating the people so that they can give a better services in the, in the mountains also, where the people are not that educated. But, uh, you know, we have to give a number of series of trainings to them so that um, their quality hygiene level can be uplifted. And uh, ultimately, uh, the, the people get uh, benefited. And during the pandemic also, because we have collected that fund, we have uh, rescued the people from uh, 60 different locations of Nepal, from 32 countries. We have rescued, we have bring them back to Kathmandu and help them to fly back to. So whenever there is a, and even during the Hudud, there were number of people who were stranded in the mountains, and you know they were, and we we find them out. We have rescued them, and even just the last month, uh, during this, uh, uh, I, I told you that the uh, monsoon brush or clouds brush, number of landslides happen, uh, and. Uh, we have even at that time also we have used that funds uh, uh, to help the uh, tourists to come out of those uh, areas. So whatever we are collecting, we are either spending for the promotion of Nepal or for the uh, to support the tourists or the Nepalese who are helping or who are the, who are going with them in the mountains for the as a support staff. So we are especially using for the betterment. Right. Thank you. I'm running out of time. Last word to Damian. Uh, Damian, you know, sustainable doesn't always connect with environment, right? It also is sustainable. Uh, how can you make sustain, bring sustainability to culture and to the local ethos of a place, and how do you promote that? Um, I know about some, some of the rural tourism initiatives that, uh, that, uh, that, that your uh, region is doing. If you can briefly talk about that, and, and okay. that can also uh, bridge uh, uh, us to, uh, to making it more sustainable on a broader scale. Okay, one of the main things here is to how we deal with all these little experiences that come up to, on the table uh, to, the, to the tourism mainstream. And uh, how these uh, social and cultural experiences that we, we say, how we can get into the mainstream. In our stage, the digital platforms are very important to connect with the tourists because tourists are carrying the devices and the mobile phone all the time. And it's where we are in contact. And we have to, we have to uh, explain them who we are, why we pay, why we ask 150, uh, 150 uh, dollars more in the, in the taxes, why we do what we do and how we do. And, and we have a few agreements, uh, one with Booking.com that led us to uh, work on the contents creator. So thankfully this agreement, this, these platforms, they have a lack of uh, good contents. So from uh, our local communities, we could feed uh, with a good contents, with a good storytelling, taking care of exactly what we want to um, um, uh, broadcast to the world about who we are, what is our uh, uh, purpose as a destination, what the res residents expect from the tourists. So it's very important to connect with these platforms. And with Google, what we are doing right now is a joint venture, Google and, and Ticketmaster, in order to manage better in a smarter way the planner of tourists that come to Barcelona. So now there is an agreement with uh, 50 attractions places and the tourists, once they arrive, uh, they can organize uh, on a smarter schedule the visits to these places. Google has, you know, the, Google has the, the, <coughs> the graphic where you can see what is uh, the maximum occupancy areas in each part of, uh, right. of the attractions that you visit. Mm -hmm. So thankfully that we achieved to do a smarter plan for the tourists that come to visit us. Mm -hmm. So we improve the tourist experiences. We have reduced two minutes uh, the waiting lanes in the in average in the in the in the attractions in, in the city. We have to achieve to lead um, uh, many leads to the website of these attractions, and we have been occupying the the parts of the schedules that we usually were very uh, low activity uh, in, in the in the city, and has improved a lot the experience of the tourist. And even more important, the noise, the safety reasons for the local residents. A few little examples that are very important to connect these little examples, social, cultural, um, good practices to the mainstream where the tourist is. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. We've run out of time. I've, in fact, overshot my time on the panel. Uh, but thank you so much for bringing in the perspective. Uh, there is a lot to learn from smaller destinations um, as well, like Sion was saying, be close to where you are. That's, that's, that's where your life is. Uh, the environment, the people, the culture, making it more niche, 
looking at a more uh, responsible tourism, even from the visitor's perspective, tourists need to be a little more, um, uh, you know, responsible. And even the industry needs to move away from the mindset of mass tourism and make it more local, make it more niche, uh, so that we can avoid over tourism. And for everything else, you have Stephen uh, to bring in all the money uh, that you would need. But thank you so much um, to all of you uh, for being on the panel. Um, thank you. you know, oh, there is a photograph as well. The panelists will be here for you to have conversations with them post the panel. I know we had very short time. Thank you so much, thank you.